Today, uh, Ben and I are going to be talking about what's new with Google Gears. In this talk, I'm going to be assuming that most people are familiar with what Gears is and the sort of features it, it's had through the last eight or nine months. Who here is not familiar with what Google Gears is? OK. Oh, it's quick. So Google Gears is an open source browser plugin that teaches current browsers new tricks. And the initial release helped browsers take web apps offline, help provide various performance features for JavaScript, uh, something called workers, which are like threads, and also give you a real uh, relational database that you could use from websites, SQLite. So I want to. You can go to the, the website to learn more about those particular features. I want to be covering some of the new developments the last few months. The first one is that when Gears was first launched, the focus was offline, that Gears equals offline. Something that we're trying to do is to change that focus, that Gears is more than offline, because it is. So I mean, obviously, we're all at Google. We all agree that the web is the platform of today and of the future. So the web is just this great place to deploy applications and do innovation, but it just takes too long to update the web. At different conferences, I like to ask, you know, who in the audience depends on the web for their business or their livelihood or their projects? Everyone raises their hand. And I say, and, and who's happy with how long it takes to get new features out to the web? And no one raises their hand. So how long do you think it takes to get a feature sort of from, from the brains of someone or the W3C or something like that? out to enough browsers that you can actually use it? Eight years. Good, good answer. Five to eight years. Five to eight years. If, if that continues, that's, that's not a great long-term trend. So what we need is we need a better way to get new features out to the web in an open way. So we're repositioning Gears, because Gears was actually always this, but we didn't say it at the beginning, that Gears is an open source update mechanism for the web. I like to have this, you know, imagine little update, updating the web, right? So that we can get out of the sort of cycle that we're in, having to wait for new browsers, having to wait for existing browsers to update. And because it's a plugin and it's in Internet Explorer, it's in Firefox, it'll be in Safari, and it's an open source project, we can get new features into the browser. So I'd say that's one of the biggest shifts the last couple of months, is to change the focus from just offline to that. So I talked about those existing pieces, right? So local server, that is how you get your user interface offline, your HTML, your CSS, your JavaScript. If you're offline, you need to be able to, to grab those from somewhere, and local server does that. A database is a real relational database. It's SQLite. There's even triggers if you want it. You've got full text indexing, very powerful. And of course, a worker pool, which is similar to threads. It, allows you to do computationally intensive things without blocking the browser. Another big development, um, really about a month ago, is uh, Charles and the team in London have put out uh, Google Gears for mobile. So this is the, those three APIs that you saw on mobile devices. Uh, the first one uh, is Windows Mobile. So Windows Mobile 5 and 6. So using the, the web browser on there, you can create applications that use dynamic HTML and use the Google Gears APIs and create mobile apps. Now, this is really cool because the Gears APIs are exactly the same. You don't have to get the permission of cell phone providers to do innovation. You deploy your web app. If users like it, they start using it. And you can use your existing web skills. So the one thing to know is the browser on there is called Pocket IE. The Gears experience is great. Pocket IE is a little difficult to work with. Um, so it's a dynamic HTML browser, but there's, there's some, uh, some things to work around. Um, because this is for public, this video is for public release, I can't say, but the, uh, Google Gears for Mobile will be on, on, uh, on more platforms. So expect to see it in places that you'd expect to see it. So one of the new, uh, the new APIs that have come out, Gears 0 0.3 is sort of slated to be released sometime soon. And one of its big features is the desktop shortcut. What this is, is it allows your JavaScript to create a shortcut to drop to the desktop and register various icons to represent that for different screen resolutions. So this will work on Linux, this will work on Mac, it'll work on Windows. So this is really useful 
to create an icon to get to your offline application, or to start creating site-specific browsers. Who here has heard of Prism? Right? Or some of the work people have been doing with WebKit around site-specific browsers. That's where you can sort of take a browser and have something that feels more like an application. Well, now you can just use this. You can drop a shortcut. You can begin to use the local database. It doesn't even have to have to do with offline. You can give a user experience that's more like an application. So this is one of the newest things that's, that's, come, that's pretty much here now in Gears. By the way, feel free. I want to kind of be running through these different new areas. Feel free to raise your hand, ask questions. Do you have any questions or angry comments or tomatoes you want to throw? Or something? So one of the big things that, that have come out recently in Gears is uh, a feature that helps cross-domain web services. So I think you know, many of us are excited about mashups. Um, so mashups are two things. They're either you know, calling services from across the web. So I could grab you know, the G data feed from a Google Calendar and mash that up with something else. But it also includes embedding components, what we use JavaScript includes for today. So uh, MySpace, I like to say, is built above people being able to embed components. That's a kind of mashup. However, while mashups are really exciting, they're actually really insecure. So who, who here in the audience knows some of the, the insecurities with current mashups? OK, yes, sir. I, I was <coughs> oh, you're just agreeing with that. OK, so <laughs> one of them is cookies. If I am example.com and I'm calling flickr.com, when I mash it up, all of Flickr's cookies are getting sent along with that request. That might be bad because Flickr may have authenticated me to use Flickr, but not for some third-party service to piggyback above that. So that's known as one of the cookie issues. Uh, other issues are cross-site scripting attacks. Because the loopholes to get this to work on the current web require that we're sending JavaScript around. So both sides have to really trust each other. Flickr.com or you know, third-party service.com can hijack my page and I can also hijack features of Flickr if I'm running from within it. So mashups are exciting, but uh, that's, that's not a good foundation for the future. And especially as we try to do some of the more sophisticated mashups, like posting data, right? where you're not just trying to get data, but you're trying to call a third-party service and post data, uh, those, those techniques are almost impossible, what they're doing under the covers. They're not very reliable, and they're actually quite slow. So you know, if we want mashups to move forward, we're pretty much at the limit of today's tech. <coughs> so Gears provides something called cross-domain workers to solve this issue in a secure way on a more reliable footing. And what it does is it allows websites to expose these APIs that are callable by third parties. And I want to, I want to step you through the model and some example code of how these work. The, uh, the, the central idea about how Gears workers work is we use messaging, right? So if I've got example.com and Flickr.com, and if they can only send strings to each other, I'm messaging, hey, Flickr.com, give me some pictures. OK, here's a list. If it's just strings, that pipe is small enough that you can't hijack either side. It's not JavaScript. And I'll, and I'll be explaining a little bit more about what that means. And of course, Gears is mediating that message exchange. Okay, and no cookies are sent, which is important. So let's look at, at what that model looks like. Can everyone see this? Yeah. All right, so let's say we've got example.com and we've got flickr.com. And I'd like to get a list of pictures for a user. Uh, with cross domain workers, example.com sends a string message get pics colon Brad Newbert. It's just a string. And flickr.com, running in the browser, some JavaScript, which I'll touch on, can get that message and say, oh, OK, I'm going to talk back to my remote server using XML HTTP request, because now I'm running within my context. And I'm going to get the list of pictures for Brad Newberg. Once I have that, I'll send back a string with the results. Here's some URLs. So everything inside this box is running inside the web browser. Uh, use first. Is that JavaScript format? Looks like a, a, an array of, of uh, yeah, strings. Uh, yeah, you want to be careful not to eval. I actually did put little brackets around this, but you want to treat it as a string. You have to think through some of those issues. I kind of wrote it as JSON, but uh, to make it a little more honest, I probably should have just erased this. It's a good. 
Because, okay, why would you not want to simply do a dummy vowel on either side? Right, because now you've gotten rid of the benefit of having just strings. But could we, I mean, wouldn't the answer be to bake JSON into Git so that we, we know we've got a JSON implementation that's actually been debugged? That's a good point. Or actually do secure JSON. So you're actually safe if you've got secure JSON. Does, does everyone know what secure JSON is? Does everyone know what JSON is? Yeah. Okay. Secure JSON, <coughs> actually, when I get some arbitrary JavaScript, it makes sure that it's really just JSON that it's just uh, property lists and it's just arrays, that I'm not calling functions inside of it, that I'm not saying window.cookies to access some object outside of its context. So is it like XML but less chatty? JSON? Of a secure JSON. So the th funny thing about secure JSON is it's just JSON. It's just, just that when you're in a browser, so JSON is supposed to just be a subset of JavaScript. Um, but in a browser, when you say eval, that string could be arbitrary. It could Say, you know, window.location.href equals foobar. And it'll get run. Secure JSON kind of scans through that and makes sure that it's just a dumb data structure. So if it is secure JSON, would you say that it's isomorphic to XML, but just with less? Not quite. Yeah, it's isomorphic to XML, a little less processing. Kind of. It's got a different, it's got a different structural model. It's, it's more isomorphic to a declarative data structure. Okay. Yeah. It, it doesn't have the attribute containment distinction. It's just a big, it's just a big dumb property list, big dumb bag. So if you're using secure JSON, you can be sending JavaScript. So what kind of time frame before we have this? Because it looks like the current interaction sort of begs people to run the So this is in Google Gears now, this feature. In secure JSON, uh, that's done at the JavaScript level, and a lot of people are using it. You actually should be using it instead of when you just finally think eval. I know it's in Dojo. I think there's some in jQuery. Um, well, but actually, Douglas Crockford has a secure JSON implementation. If you think it's so important, why isn't it something that's being provided by Gears? Yeah. Uh, it's a good question, and probably moving forward it should be. Yeah, but you don't have to wait for it, because you can do it at the JavaScript level. But, right I mean, we know in general people suck at writing parsers, right? And they're very error prone, they're hard to get right. Uh, so what you've done is you've set up this situation where you're saying, oh, they're just passing string. But they're not. They're going to pass structured data, and then they're going to parse it, and they're going to do a bad job of it, and there's going to be exploits. And that's predictable. Like, it's, it's a reality of the design choices you've made. So I would say if you really want this to be a secure channel, you need to get secure JSON as soon as you can. I agree. Um, so any other questions? Yeah. So the basic idea here is that Flickr.com has created a or expose the URL that contains the JavaScript that implements a particular API, and that's <coughs> And I'll show you. Uh, okay. Like. Okay. So I wanted to make sure that you got the messaging idea, right, that we're messaging. So let's see what that looks like at a JavaScript level. So here's my example.com. Here's my, some JavaScript on that side. Flickr.com also has to host some JavaScript. So we're calling it API.js. So the first thing is, over here, we get a worker pool. And who here has worked with worker pools? Yeah. So instead of um, having the worker pool run how it usually does, we say initialize the worker, and we give it a URL to this guy right here, api.js. Then we send it a message. Remember? We send it a message, and we send the message git picks colon Brad Newberg. Over on this side, same thing. He gets a worker pool, but he has to turn on cross origin. You have to say, allow me to be contacted cross-origin. And then we create a message handler to receive messages. So on message. Now inside this message handler, it will be called whenever some client sends a message. And you can actually do whitelisting in here. You can get the, the, the host that's talking to you if you wanted to. So you could make sure it just comes from corp.google.com if you wanted to. Right here, we're not doing that. We're saying anyone is coming in. So we receive the message, and we say if it's get pics, we get our list of pictures. I've omitted that here. That would be an XML HTTP request call, because now it's running in the context of Flickr.com. And then we send a message with the, with the results, that list of URLs. Over on this side, we also have a message handler, same thing, and we get the list of results and display them. So Ben has actually made a really cool demo 
that I'd like to show you <coughs> that actually does this. Does a networker implicitly um, cache it in the resource book? No. Can you create, can you add a cross-origin URL to a manifest? Yes, and that's actually, um, uh, you can do that. That can be helpful for authentication, for example. Only for workables or in general? So when I message flickr.com, that uh, handler could call any of the Gears APIs. So it could set up a local relational database to capture data. It could capture <coughs> URLs with the local server so that a subset of flickr.com's material will work offline. And some people have... Uh -huh. it, it exists within the origin that the worker file is in. So when the worker file creates a database, then that database will exist within the origin. Does that make sense? So you can't normally do a cross-origin um, resource grab, uh, a capture, um, but if you do it with a worker, then you can do a cross-origin. Okay, so what happens if I call a knit worker with a cross-origin URL that is not cached and I'm offline? Uh, Does it just fail? That will fail. So, there's, so there has to be like an online initialization phase where... That's actually a good question. If something has been captured... That's not something that's, uh, that we've really gotten into. It should and work. So the developer is expected. Should to work. Initialization work is required. Yeah, but you you can't do that because you wouldn't be able to uh, cache the worker file because it would be cross. Right. You actually have to invoke it first and it caches itself. That's interesting. If you called it yes. the second yes. time and you exactly. cached API.js, it should work. I mean, I I think I've heard of people using this for authentication. You've got a third party site that has authentication. You redirect to it. It's been captured if you're offline, so you can still authenticate. Uh, people, what you said is yeah. So uh, Ben took Flickr.com, and obviously he can't host the API.js there. So he created a um, sort of a PHP proxy, living sort of on his in his home directory, and then from a JavaScript file that lived on a different domain that basically used this. So um, I don't know why it's off the screen. Let's. So basically that you could submit, if we submit the color blue, it's going to ask Flickr using like a string, what is the tag, you know, I'm sorry, give me all the pictures that are tagged blue. So when I hit submit, it's doing that, getting back a list of the pictures. Um, that's interesting. <laughs> <laughs> you never know, it's kind of like uh, Russian roulette, but I picked a very innocuous blue, you know. Um, so yeah. pictures came back, Ben added image tags to it that now could then point to all those URLs that were given. It's just on this, I, I have to share this very yeah. quick story. A friend of mine does this same uh, example using orange as uh, his innocuous word. And recently a friend of his but has been uploading pornographic images oh. of the <laughs> orange in the tags specifically to screw up his damage. <laughs> oh, wow. It's good that I didn't tell anyone about this beforehand. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. But he probably I'd see Joe get this Prezzo again with blue. Yeah, Anyone have any ideas? It's gonna be it's gonna be a different color. Christmas. Yeah, yeah. It's actually, yeah, if you want to just tell us what keyword you're gonna use for future demos and we'll make sure there's some like interesting <laughs> stuff in there. So that way if like a presentation's going bad helps picks it up. Uh, Hanukkah. <laughs> can we recurse? Can can uh, our worker over here do this again for another demo? That's a good question, I'm not sure. I don't see why not, but it's something that would be worth testing. If our worker over here does it for another domain, yeah. but we're still ultimately instantiated from example.com, because I imagine if, if foo.com wants to talk to Flickr, it'll build its own worker, right? Yeah. So if Flickr builds a worker uh -huh. to talk to bar.com, and example.com also builds a worker to talk to bar.com, are they the same worker because they're in the same session, or do they diverge? Uh, I don't know. It's a good question. You should come and jump on the Google Gears engineering list and help us think these things through. It's been thought through pretty well. Chris Prince put this together. So he's the Gears worker guy. Okay. Yes. 
So there's, uh, I guess, some C++ code that, that is native to particular browsers? Yes. Yeah. That is the glue? That's right. This is being mediated by the browser. <coughs> how many other teams at Google have uh, browser plugins, and how much code do you guys share? You know, unfortunately, I think we're, this is a public video. Nope. So I can't necessarily mention that. But um, I think it's well known that Picasa has a plugin for uploading. Uh, well, Toolbar's not a plugin, though. Those are all lovely. Cool. Yes? So how does this compare the cross-domain features that IE8 and Firefox 3 have? This is good. So uh, there's lots of folks trying to solve this problem. So IE8 has sort of a cross-domain model. Um, uh, Firefox is using a um, Firefox. Is it in Firefox 3 yet? I think it's planned for that. It's a, uh, there's kind of a proposal at the W3C for cross-domain services. Um, those depend on setting a header on the server. Um, this is good. I'm happy to see browser innovation again. And so we'll see which model is the one that lands and becomes the most used. So there's several different ones up in the air. Uh, on the Gears team, we're also you know, talking <coughs> about what would it look like to support some of these. Have you looked at OAuth as well for this, in this area? That's interesting. So OAuth would be something that would, that would use something like this, right? So it would live above it. Um, so it'd be really useful to look at OAuth and see, are we providing what OAuth needs to... So because this is not necessarily for authentication. This is for uh, arbitrary mashups of web services. So OAuth could live above this. Or OAuth could be used as a standard authentication mechanism. But I see it as a layer above. Um, it seems like you're, like at a high level, it looks a lot like SOAP. Uh, have you given any thought to integrating this with SOAP services to sort of open up the scope of what you can access, and also why use that model instead of like REST or something else? So I see this as living uh, below both of those. Okay. Um, this is a small primitive that you could use to build a JavaScript SOAP library above it, or you could use this in order to do those things. Right, but it, so, it requires you to, to, to have code deployed on every service site you want to access. So there's a lot of debates. There, there needs to be something turned on on a third-party service. It's a little bit of friction that's a positive friction. So Flash has a cross-domain.xml file that needs to be hosted. And that says, hey, I can be mashed up. Um, uh, you know, uh, some of the, the, like the Firefox and IE8 require you to turn on a server header. There's a new header. So you need to do something. It reminds me of like in Java, you need to mark something as being remote. You know, it's, a, it's kind of like a marker interface in a, in a sense that it shows that the third party service at least went through the thought processes of, okay, I want to be allowed to be in this. So being able to call arbitrary things is probably risky. So all the models require you to do something on the third party site. Yeah. Is there some sort of descriptive markup for what services are available in this? I mean, so, um, like a WSDL or something? No, that's interesting. So crossdomain.xml for Flash yeah. is a real lightweight XML file that says it's a whitelist of domains. Uh, in this sense, the JavaScript file is that. The JavaScript file on the third-party service is mediating what can be done. So if you simply don't want to you know, turn on the method foobar and you get the string foobar, you don't do anything, or you return an error code or something. But is there a descriptive like, format for, like, if I there, went to Flickr and read this file, I'd have yeah. to be able to read JavaScript to see what was available. Again, this would be tooling support. That yeah. might be interesting. Maybe, you know, there's there's like, actually not WSDL, but there has been, um, I know in the Dojo project and Chris Zip mm -hmm. has been active in the JSON community to create a JSON sort of uh, descriptor for third-party services. That that would look, so in Gears. A lot of the idea is let's provide primitives that are like XML HTTP requests mm -hmm. that others can build upon to do these things. So it's just sort of little little blips of functionality that can give rise to new kinds of web applications. I totally that sounds cool. You should build that <laughs> <laughs> with, with your magical right. free time, right? Yeah, totally. <laughs> so do that. yeah, do soap and wisdom about man. Get this in enterprises. That'd be no, cool. I'd in your native yeah. <laughs> or, or do this, J, this JSON descriptor format. It's great. It's like a three-page spec. It's super simple. 
Um, Many things are easy to specify. How would you do? No, it's it's well done. It's it's oh, it's called SMD, simple message something. Whatever. So a uh, little little footnote: if you've been using workers, it used to be you couldn't make XHR calls. You can now. So that can help if you want to have a background worker that's syncing every three minutes, that's doing some other kind of activity. Maybe you're doing like a comment D kind of thing, where that's where you have a persistent connection to the server. That can be nice here because now you're not messing with the browser's UI. With which semantics? Uh, like XHR has slightly different, you know, like semantics depending on which browser you're running. Is it the same for all workers now, or is it? This is a shim that calls down to the browser's native XHR. So the way you would work use it is is standard XHR. And if there's a quirk on a particular browser, it's the same quirk. So on IE, get requests are incorrectly cached. So your worker code has to be aware of the fact that it may be running in a different, or it has to know which browser it's running in. Either that or you have to select a script specific to the browser when you create the worker. Let me think about this. You know, is XHR a shim or it's their own? I think that it works um, identically. Yeah, I think so. I think I was wrong. So it's actually, it's I think like it is a fresh. It is. Okay. Using. There's like a W3C spec or HTML5 that has spec'd out, here's how XHR is supposed to work. I, I was wrong. I thought it was a shim, but it's not. Is it? so, yes, uh -huh. Using this, how many, like, how many workers could I spin up in my own domain to make simultaneous XHR requests? So unfortunately, it would be really, so do you know about the connection limit on IE? Uh, yeah. Yeah, so it has I, a two. it has a two. This still respects the two connection limit, which I know. So all of these, all of these like workers because that, that are running off in their own space really are just. Not. So you can't you can't use it to get around the connection limit on IE, but if you're doing processing, if you're getting XML, if you're getting JavaScript from your remote service and you're processing that, that's pretty powerful because you're not blocking the UI. So does that connection limit apply to the workers that I instantiated in other domains? No, because then they would be part of that domain's two connection limit. Does everyone know what these connection <coughs> limits are? Internet Explorer can only open two connections to the same host at the same time. No, Firefox doesn't do it. Safari doesn't do it, I don't think. Actually, this is a case. IE is actually following the spec. The HTTP 1.1 spec says you should only have two ongoing connections. So given that IE 8 has, like, so IE is about six. Six, yeah. Is that, since Microsoft apparently approves, is that something that we can follow suit Oh, I'm sure. And I don't know. I don't know why it does. I think that the two connection limit might be at a lower level than IE. It might be when it calls down to the OS to, to, to do these calls. So that's why there was trouble. Um, but yes? What part was the most fun was building this? Uh, well, I'm the developer advocate, so I didn't actually get to do C++ on this. Um, what I enjoy the most, I enjoy these cross-domain workers a lot. I think they're really cool. I, I, I see that as this blue sky thing that could, someone's going to do something that in hindsight is going to be, oh, of course. And it's going to turn the corner like Google Maps did yeah. or Gmail. And I'm waiting, Gmail legitimized XHR, actually DHTML. No one was using DHTML before, you know, before Gmail. Everyone was like, oh, that's dead, isn't it? So I'm, <laughs> I'm waiting to see, or I'd love to brainstorm with someone, what's that thing that makes this, Oh, I couldn't live without that feature. Has anyone used this to build a key store yet? No, but that would be cool. By the way, we're, we're, there's general crypto discussions in terms of how can gears help crypto that are, that, are being ha that are happening in the open source community. So that'd be a part of that. And people are very excited about that because um, we could finally maybe get some decent crypto into the browsers that JavaScript can hook into to go to the next level on that. It's a good question. Though. Just to add on to that, yeah. um, I just asked the engineer who designed Working Pool, and um, you do get two connections per domain, mm -hmm. but right, so there is a two connection limit, so, yeah. but it is per domain. So if you had three workers on three different domains, then yeah. you have six connections. Possible. That's really interesting, actually, because some people have used subdomains as a way to get around this problem. So you could have, you know, my main app, you know, app.foo.com, and then b.foo.com. I could deploy for streaming and then do messaging if you wanted to do some advanced kind of common thing. So let's just move. We got a, a little bit more material. I want to make sure we get through it. 
there's been a new release of Dojo Storage. Uh, Dojo Storage is a project I created, part of the Dojo project. Um, Dojo Storage uh, gives you a consistent API as a programmer. You, f you get a persistent hash table, basically, like Berkeley DB. And under the covers, it uses the best storage mechanism available. So it will use Gears if Gears is there. It will use Flash if Flash is there. And it will use HTML5 if that's there, such as in Firefox 2. And it's actually uh, several years old. There's a new release that refactored a lot of it and got it leaner and meaner. Um, let me show this to you. This is a testing page for Dojo Storage. So basically, you save keys and values, right? Just like a hash table. So right now, it's showing me what keys I've stored and then a value. I've stored nothing at this point. And right here, it's telling me the storage provider that was auto-detected. So it sees that I have gears. It looks like you can override that if you want. Yes, and we're going to override that. Here's the other. So things are detected in this order. If gears is there, we use that, because it's the most performant of the storage options. HTML5 is used, if that's present. Also known as a what working group. And finally, Flash is used. This can be used to store hundreds of K or megabytes of data. And I'll show you some examples of that. I've got two links here. I have a test book from Project Gutenberg. It's actually Faust by Gerte, 240K. So I have this link that will save it into storage just to show you. And then I've got some test XML, which is an atom feed, just to show you can start saving sort of uh, things that have some more you know, knowledge to them. So let's do the test book. There it showed up. There's a value. There's Faust. Save the test XML. This is an atom feed from my blog. Now let's jump to the Flash storage provider. Here's what's cool about the Flash storage provider. Flash is on 97% of the installed base of the internet. So with these three options with Dojo storage, you have reliably hit a tremendous number of, uh, you, you can start using client-side storage today. So with Flash, the way Flash works is once you go over 100K, you're prompted, similar to how Gears asks you the first time. So let's allow that. There it is. Here's our test XML. And then, now we're, let's do the HTML5. Same thing. And all this works on Internet Explorer, Safari, and Firefox. Cro uh, Linux, Mac OS X, Windows. So there's a new, new release of this happened two weeks ago. I put out two weeks ago. Uh, open source. Any questions? So I'm going to quickly jump into PubTools. PubTools is an open source toolkit I put out about a month ago. So one of the problems is if there's all sorts of static content that would be really nice to take offline. Um, on code.google.com, we've got reference guides. I'm always looking up Java and JavaScript references. Uh, the commuter timetables. I always have to jump back online to get them for the buses. What if we could make it so it takes five minutes, almost with no JavaScript skills, to take those offline? So PubTools does that. What you do is you link in a JavaScript library that we've created, and you sprinkle a little bit of magic HTML on top. And it helps take things offline. So let me show you. I want to step you through. Here's a demo. So this is a demo page. It's got some CSS. It's got some JavaScript. Um, PubTools actually drops a real lightweight UI. And I'll show you. It drops a link download offline. So it also will create a desktop shortcut. So here it's asking, can, can I make uh, So let's give it the permission for the shortcut. And there it is. I know my desktop is a mess. I know. Tell me about it, huh? There is, yeah, there is that demo of Gears Pub Tools. If I double click that, it'll open this guy back up. And this guy will now work offline. Can you set a, a, a preference across all of Gears as to whether or not we ever want to be prompted about the desktop shortcut? 
you can't set cross cutting like you can in Firefox, which is nice. Um, you can disallow once you're asked, but you can't set per. That's a good idea to be able to set capabilities essentially. Because I, I don't want anyone to ever ask me if they can put some file on my desktop. Uh huh. So you basically just never want that feature to work. Yeah, and I'd, yeah. I'd be willing to go into a preference panel and tell it never let this work. These are good. These are good. You've had some good feedback. We can talk. We can summarize it and get it to the the gears dudes. Um, so let's quickly look at uh, what this looks like in here. So here's our HTML for that page. First thing we drop in our script, pubtools-gears.js. Then on our HTML, we add gears-manifest and we point to our manifest file. And there's also a tool that will make these manifest files for you. I'll show you quickly. If you want a shortcut, you just say shortcut equals true. Gears Pub Tools will fill out all the information for the shortcut using intelligent defaults. It'll take the URL of the page. It'll take the title of the page and use that as the description, or actually as the name. You can override these if you want using meta tags. And then you need to provide at least one icon, and we use link rel tags. So you just say rel shortcut.icon, you give the size, and then you point to, uh, to the file. So, Straightforward. Is the icon needed even if you don't want a, like a desktop icon? No, if you, if you actually, you can just, if you don't want shortcuts at all, just, it default, oh, it's it's just shortcut defaults to false. So if you just want to take content offline, you don't need any of that shortcut stuff. As a matter of fact, you could just have the Gears Manifest thing. Is that going to work for next HTML since those will be OEO attributes? Uh, no. We can have a larger discussion about XHTML. <laughs> <laughs> Let's just say I wrote a blog post called XHTML Considered Harmful. <laughs> and that's a, a religious battle I can't get yeah, into right now. Yeah, but it's not HTML5, by the way. Um, <laughs> you know what? I'm sure someone could adapt a namespace for it. I just didn't. Um, so let's uh, quickly... What happened to... So you still have to make that manifest file, right? So we now have a bookmarklet that will generate the manifest files for you. You just drag it up to here, which I already have. I'll just drag it again. And then you go to the page that you'd like to work offline, and you click it, and it will slurp the page and discover all resources. Flash, script, CSS. It'll even look in your CSS file and look for URLs and backgrounds. So it's pretty complete. Um, and here we go. You just cut and paste this, save it into a manifest file. So you can imagine going to uh, the documentation for GData, clicking this, hint, hint, pub tools enabling it, <laughs> and boom, five minutes, you now have a nice thing you can put in your snippets and you help the Gears team. <laughs> Let me just, yeah, okay, the next one's, yeah, we can talk about this. So we are taught, we're in discussions putting together a location API. Um, it's still at the design stage. The idea is that your JavaScript, once it's given permission, can ask for the latitude and longitude and the accuracy, and that will be handed back to it so you can now create social location-aware applications. So you can imagine this showing up on all the different Gears platforms. Under the covers, it'll use the best location provider available, GPS, cell phone tower triangulation, and so on. So yes? When I'm asked uh, if I can know the position and accuracy, uh -huh. do I get to determine the accuracy that a particular application gets to see, or do I have to set that across the board? So it's, the user doesn't set the accuracy. The accuracy is returned so that JavaScript that's using it can know if the accuracy is a thousand feet. I understand feet. that. Yeah. Right? But just because I have a GPS uh, system in my pocket that knows where I am within 10 meters does not mean that I want Flickr.com to know where I am within 10 meters. So you've given me no choice between telling them everything I know and telling them nothing at all. Mm -hmm. And I'd like to be able to smear that. I mean, I consider that like a, sort of a, a firewall of location position. 
These are good. So you could imagine in the settings dialog, it might say, you know, um, minimum accuracy allowed. So this is another good idea we can we can summarize. Well, I, I don't want that to be global settings. That would be nice too. Yeah. I want that to be able to do that on a per uh, application basis. Yeah. So you should have a look at do that. Fire Eagle and what they've done there, because they've thought that stuff through pretty well. What's that? You should have a look at Fire Eagle and what they've done for that. Okay. You've got to get something. They've thought that stuff through pretty well. Cool. About fuzzing locations in different. Yeah. Different, uh, do they actually fire change the location or just turn down the accuracy? <clears throat> um, it's they they quantize it, I think. Uh -huh. They quantize it to, to nearest um, city or whatever. It's a good, it's a good point. They're so the same point. It's a good point. <laughs> yeah. So, um, unfortunately, we just have to turn off the camera for a second. So, Ben's going to do some uh, cool demos for us of interesting gears things. Okay, so yeah, I'm just going to show you guys some demos of some of the cool things that you can do with Gears right now. Um, the first one I want to show you guys is Worker Pool, because uh, Worker Pool, you can do a lot of complex computations in the background and still have the UI function pretty well. So what this demo does is it calculates prime numbers, and we're going to first run it in JavaScript normally. Then we're going to use um, Worker Pool to um, do two processes calculating prime numbers. Meanwhile, you'll see up here the UI, um, it'll start bouncing back and forth, this little bar, and it's going to lag really bad as we're doing it in JavaScript. So you can see those primes are just going down, and the bar starts jumping because it's essentially one thread. So we'll stop that, and we'll do this demo with worker pool. So I'll start two threads, and you can see that um, it really doesn't get in the way of the UI. One of my favorite demos because it, uh, it's a huge difference between the two. So um, another one of the demos I want to show you guys is uh, highlighting browser versus desktop applications. Um, right now, browser applications are a lot different than desktop applications. And um, I think that there are some huge benefits for making browser applications acting like desktop applications. For one, with a desktop, you have to make a couple different clients for all the different um, operating systems that you use. And then another huge problem with it is that you've got to deal with the auto-updating. So if you want to push a new update for the program, you either have to have an auto-update function in your program, or you've got to go around and update all of them separately. So um, if you actually had um, just a web application acting like a desktop application, you could update it quite easily. So the demo that I'm going to show you guys is called Blog Ears. Some of you guys might have seen it. It's actually a demo that. Um, one of my colleagues, Pamela Fox, made. So all it's going to do is it's, uh, it's using the Blogger uh, JS API and Gears, and it's going to um, re-implement Blogger as Blogger Offline. So let's log in. Actually, you know what? I've got a special tab for this. So first, it's going to ask me if I want to use Gears. Yep. Then over here on this tab, I've got my blog open just so we can see the updates happen. Come on. Well, right now, it uh, should be asking for the uh, if I want to make a desktop icon. But uh, actually, let's do that. Clear store. Refresh. OK, well, it's not asking me if I want to do a desktop icon, but it should be. Um, so the desktop icon is the same thing that Brad talked about. That's because the, 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 the method signature changed the last two weeks. Oh. So the, well, that'll cause a problem. Um, so I'll go through and first download all of my posts. So these are my posts that I have right now. And now I'm going to go into offline mode. So when I click Work Offline, I can no longer use the internet. I'll just show you guys. Um, There we go. So it shows that we're offline. And uh, I'm going to do three simple operations. I'm going to create a post, edit a post, and delete a post. So let's delete my last one. Then let's go ahead and create one. 
Publish it. And then let's edit one. So. And republish it. So you'll see over here on my blog that uh, I'm going to be editing this post right here. I'm going to be deleting this post right here. And then there should be a new one created. Um, down on my console, you can see what's happening. Um, it's trying to make pings to a resource to see if we're online. These are all failing because we're not online. But as soon as we go back online, it's going to ping those resources, realize that we are online, and it's going to um, do all the operations that I just told it to do. So just give it a sec, and it will ping this resource and do a couple operations. There we go. So now the UI's uh, changed, showing that those posts that we had edited are now updated to the internet. So if I refresh my blog page, it will show that uh, I've got my new post there. I edit this one, and um, I deleted the one that was before this. So just an example of how uh, you can create applications web applications that are using Gears and make them a lot more like a desktop application. Again, if it had worked, we would have had a, a desktop icon right there, so then we could have easily gone to our application. Okay. Let's see, where's my other window? Here we go. Uh, Brad already showed the cross-domain application, so we'll breeze past that. And then there's two more applications I want to show. Uh, one is showing how you can speed up uh, operations on the client side, and another is showing how you can use Google Gears to save uh, server computing power and push that all the computations to the client. So the first one is an application I made. And uh, basically what it's going to do is when you click on one of the presidential candidates, it's going to go out and do a request for a feed, which re is going to return news about them. And the first time that it goes out, it's going to go to the internet and do that request. But then the second time you click on a, the same presidential candidate, it will try and get that information from Gears, because Gears is going to store that, uh, that feed. And meanwhile, while it's populating the data from Gears the second time that you click it, it's also going to go do an internet operation, uh, an internet request to go get the newest, uh, newest feed. So the result of that is that you're going to have really fast requests and always have fresh data. So let's click here populate some of them. So these are the first times I'm clicking them, and these are all coming from the internet. Now you'll see they immediately come back up because this data is being served from Gears. And you can see that down here. I'm, uh, I'm showing the query that I'm doing, and I'm showing where it's loaded from, Gears of the Internet. So you know, first it'll request, for, request from Gears, and then the internet. And you get that fast effect. Up here, these are from the internet. So yeah, just an example of how you can speed things up by uh, storing stuff on the client in the database and populating results from there. Here's the demo that's going to show uh, you uh, taking the processing off of the server and putting it on the client. What happened was Dig had um, a feature where you could look at all the things that you had dug before. And they had to take that down because it was taking too many of their resources. So they stopped doing that. Well, one of the users, Brian Shaler, um, in the Gears community wrote this application. And what it does is it goes out and grabs all the things that you've dug before, and it populates them into the Gears database. So then whenever you search for what you've dug, it'll be um, extremely fast. So I've already downloaded uh, the articles of this user previously, and everything's indexed. So you can see it's pretty fast to uh, pull up all of the things that this user has dug, recently submitted. Um, yeah, so a pretty cool demo on how to take things off of the server and put them onto the client. You can imagine you could do some pretty cool things with that. Um, the last thing is uh, using Gears with Grease Monkey. I wrote a script to make Wikipedia offline. And this is an example of how you can implement Gears on websites that you want to have Gears support for. So if you guys aren't familiar with Grease Monkey, Grease Monkey is just um, a Firefox extension that allows you to write JavaScript code that can edit a page after it's already loaded. So what I'm doing here is I'm injecting Google Gears code into Wikipedia after an article loads. So let's enable it. And let's go to an article. So if I was going on a flight and I wanted to just read some random articles in Wikipedia, 
Yeah. That's so cool. So, um, like, on the right-hand side, you can see, well, it, was, it had a little spinning icon. So all my scripts does is it parses all the links, everything on the, um, on the web page, and it takes those. Like one deep. Yeah. Oh, wow. And it just stores them in the Gears cache. Get that? It's it's online. <laughs> Sorry. Just, Can I yeah. Me? yeah, definitely. So, any, are there any PHP hackers in here? Yeah, PHP hackers in the house. So, um, we want to get this into MediaWiki as a PHP patch, as a plugin, rather than Grease Monkey, so it can show up on Wikipedia. So, if you want to see a workshop on Wikipedia, and maybe then once we have that, we can try to get this on one laptop per child. So, I'll so, show you uh, what's happening in the background. So, if I go to World War II, I know I've used that article a lot for testing because it's got like 100 different pictures on it. So you can see in the console all the things that are happening. On the right-hand side, we're going to see it downloading. So it's downloading. But down here, you can see all of the resources that are being put into the Gears cache as it goes. Um, there are some interesting hacks that I had to do for this because um, you can't, in Gears, you can't use Resource Store to pull a resource offline that exists on another domain. And every single picture and every single resource on a Wikipedia page exists on another domain. So there's a little bit of uh, iframe hackery that I had to do. But, um, yeah, but we can use the cross-domain workers. But you could also use cross-domain workers, if, uh, assuming you had access to wikipedia.com or .org. <laughs> but anyways, this is just um, a cool example, because it shows you that you can use Grease Monkey to put gears on any site that you want. So if there's a site that you think needs to have gear support, just uh, use Grease Monkey and put the support in yourself. So those are some compelling demos I want to show you guys to, to prove that Gears is more than just about offline. Um, yeah. Anything else you want to say? Can I just grab that real quick? Yeah. I just want to put two URLs up here. Um, So there were a lot of great suggestions. You had a lot of great feedback. If you go to go slash gears contribute, that'll take you right to the Google, Gear, Google Gears engineering list. This is an open source project. Uh, it's a lot stronger when the kind of feedback you have comes from real users versus me. Uh, it makes much more of an impact. So I really encourage you. There are a lot of great ideas. Please jump on there. Um, if you want to see a particular kind of gear, jump on there. And if you want to use pub tools, just go to go slash pub tools. And there's only one JavaScript file you need to grab. Yeah. Public address. Oh, pu that's right. <laughs> Public address. Uh, just go to Google and type Gears space pub tools. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, the Gears contribute is just nested from gears.google.com in the, uh, the open source community part. <coughs> Sorry for people with the non. Go ahead.